Christo, welcome. Today I'm talking about the name for Wales. We often go into what it means in Nigmarag in the Welsh language, but we don't actually focus enough, nor take enough pride in, I think, about what it means truly in English. We tend to assume that it just means foreigners, Welsh, which it does in a way, but it doesn't. We've simplified it and forgotten its original meaning and how the peoples who became the English saw us and what it says about us. And I think we need to mention it more and take pride in it. So this is Ben Schwellen. That's what this video is about today. I found this uh, map on Reddit, and I hope the author, whoever it is, does not mind me using it. It's a splendid thing, and it describes all the different places, or many of them, across Europe, which have this Valhus root. A Germanic word for foreigner, stranger, southerner, Celt, Roman. And why does it have so many meanings, and why is it all over Europe? Well, let's begin with Wales, which is what this is about. So, when the Saxon tribes came into Britain, they were using a word that was quite similar to the Germanic word of Walehaus. It was more like Wela or Vela. And that became the word Wales, which is the plural form of it, for Wales, meaning foreigner. But it did not just mean foreigner, it meant Romanized. Person. And as you go through this video, you'll see why. It's a very layered word and it changed over time. And as you can see on this map here, there are lots of little polka dots. And these are places in England where Welsh speakers were not completely assimilated in the first few waves and they held on to their language for a long time. See my video on English place names if you would like to know more about those. But these, you get words like Walton, which is basically Welshman farm. And the English coming in saw these as of Romans. Some of the earliest writings in their Saxon language, you get a poem, Widsith, which means wide journey or the traveler's song. And it's written from the Saxon point of view, saying, we're not British. Remember where we came from in this heroic post-Roman age. It describes battles between the Goths and the Huns. And it's describing the peoples of Northern Europe, trying to get the Saxons to remember their roots not being in Britain. And he describes a people called Rumvala, and what this is, is Roman Welsh, okay? And these people he locates, I think somewhere in, in Middle Gaul, present day South East Central France. And that's important. Keep that in mind, that region as we go forward. Look at the map again. You have Cornwall. And cord means horn, a long horn. And it's interesting that they fused the Saxon word and the British word together. Now to explain why they saw them as Romans, we need to go back to the beginning of this word and go around Europe and explain how each of these regions formed in a context from a Germanic point of view. So back, so back when the Germanic language was forming, up in the southern bits of Scandinavia, you had a word which would have been more like Valer or Voli, and this meant Southerner, Celt Southerner, rather than Foreigner so much. And by the time of Julius Caesar, you had a people, I'm going to pronounce this probably according to what the Latin would have at the time, Voltia. So you can hear that, Voltia. If you don't harden the sea, it's very much like Welsh or Welsh. 
And it's worth noting that Julius Caesar said that this is not what this tribe called themselves, but the peoples north of the rivers, probably on the other side of the Danube and that region, called these people. So these people were probably just southern Celts in name to these Germanic peoples. But as time went on, the Celts between the German tribes in Rome were squeezed out. I mean, that's two quite brutal peoples to be between, isn't it? And so the Germans didn't have a Celtic people to the south anymore, but they were still using this word foreigner. And this became slowly to do with the Roman Empire itself. Not all foreigners, but specifically a Roman. So let's go to perhaps the most famous Celtic part of the Roman Empire outside Britain, Gaul. Now, don't make the mistake that Gaul itself the first time came from a Germanic source. This came from Gallia in Latin, what would have probably been a transliteration from a Celtic source into Latin. But when the Franks came in as the empire was crumbling, they seemed to have asked what this place was. And they came up with this old word, Gaul, or at least the people in what was Gaul thought, because by this time Gaul was becoming an older word. And when the German Franks came in, they said Wallia. And these people thought they were saying Gaul. And so Gaul came back into use, not from Latin, but from Germanic. And so this area that's now France became Gaul again for a time. But you get lots of little bits along this Roman Germanic frontier. If you look at Switzerland, this one's quite interesting because the borders of the Roman Empire in many parts are still reflected today in the linguistic boundaries. So the area that speaks French in Swiss German, that's Verschland in French, I mean, that's Romandy, right? Roman. And that carries on. So you have the Romansh language. And you have a place in this area called Valgau. And this was the boundary at that time between the Germans and the Romansh speakers. And you have saints in this area. Saint Galen. Gal. He was of Irish descent, but he was from Alsace, and he was from a very interesting area. He was from a Welsh speaking area. On the map here, Welsh. This word didn't just give the name for the Welsh language in English. Um, there's a dialect of the Alsatian language, Welsh, it's called, or Welsh in, in French. A dialect of Lorraine Roman, and that's specifically where that saint came from, and that's important. This would have been an area where the original Gaulish language may have held out a bit longer. So this saint, who was Irish by descent, had been in this area where there was a residual Celtic, insular Celtic community, and then he had gone to the Romansh areas, and the Germans came in. They saw him as a Roman foreigner, not just a foreigner. You get Valonia, you get all kinds of little sprinkling place names up along the river Rhine where there were Roman forts. And then you get something a bit interesting in the Netherlands, Valkyren. Now this place, it was on the periphery, but it was a port. And you had a Roman deity, Nahalenia. For anyone who speaks Welsh, I bet you caught the word in that. Nehalenia. Halen is the word for salt in Welsh. And in this Roman settlement with this Welsh word in it, you had a, a deity, probably a sea deity. And there's various suggestions of what this goddess's name means. But to me, I look at it as a Welsh speaker and I see Nev, which is like heaven, Holland, salt, ah, uh, 
feminine, heavenly goddess of salt. That's what it that's what it looks like to me. And you probably had traders going across the North Sea because the Britons were part of the Roman Empire. And many of them had full citizenship. And so they could take advantage of the economic opportunities. And this may have been an enclave where Welsh or Britons became semi-dominant outside Britain due to commercial activity. But as you move east, you have different types of Germanic tribes. And so the word, the word, the word changes. Valchensi. Sorry about my German pronunciation. This area was inhabited clearly by a Celtic-speaking people, this lake in southern Germany, for quite a long time, but it had probably become Latinized just before the Germans really assimilated it. So it wasn't Celtic-speaking at the point where this name came to mean that, but it would have been residual memory of a Celtic speaking people and so the Germans would have thought and seen that these were Romanized Celts okay they were seeing these as a specific kind of foreigner a fusion between Celtic and Roman and as you move east this changes slightly there's less of the Celtic influence and more of other things, but they're still Romanized peoples. You get the Vlachs, the Romanians, basically, and the main principality which formed Romania, it was more than one, was Wallachia. And we know that the Gothic tribes moved in in the fourth century, and maybe this accounts that there's some kind of dialect difference here between the Wales in the west and the Vlachs in the east. It's that the German language was changing, but they still had the same cultural connotation, that these were Romanized foreigners, specifically. And as you go north, in the, the lands that would have been Dacia or Dacians, in the Carpathians, and going into southern bits of Poland, there's evidence that these Dacians emigrated or migrated into these lands. They must have carried a fusion culture, Dacian Roman, with them. Because when the Goths came in, they saw them as Romans, or Romanized. And there's a few of these place names in southern Poland that kind of remember that time, certainly by the 5th century, but just before the Slavs were truly moving in. The Goths set these names in, and then the Slavs changed it a bit, but kept that Vol initial element. And this Vlach element, you see it throughout the Balkans, because the Goths, even though they were replaced by the Slavs, those names stuck as meaning Romanized people. And you have languages related to Romanian today. And that's what they're called, basically, these people, these Vlachs. And this gives us Morlach. This, this is an area kind of on the Croatian coast, Morlachia. This became a very romanticized folk people by the Croats at one point. And from Greek, this probably comes, this name Morlach, meaning black Vlachs, right? This is a very vaguely defined region. One I wanted to mention was Vlasko, and this was a group of Romanians, basically, who traveled northwest and settled in Moravia, an historical region of the Czech lands. And they kept their language and identity for 500 years, certainly their language. We know that they were there by the 1300s. By the 1700, 1750, they were losing a lot of their words. And certainly by the 19th century, they were fully Slavicized. But even today, they keep a separate identity and are known as this word, Velasco. One more we should mention is the word for Italy in Polish, which is not a Germanic language, Vlochy. 
this came through a Germanic language into Polish and you, you can't underestimate the influence of the German languages upon Polish simply because of historical, you could say misfortune or precedent, whichever one. But Catholicism is very important and for the word for Italy itself to come from this source, these people were traveling through German-speaking lands to reach Italy and people must have come with them and described it as being Welsh, you know, these Romanized foreigners, and the Polish must have picked it up. It's important for we Welsh to understand that we were Romans, and we were identifying as that, and proudly so. And so when the Germans came, that's what they saw initially. They didn't see us quite so as Celts. They saw us as Romans. And that's how we behave, how we greeted them. And it's important that we don't Forget that, yes, we have this British part, but the Romano part fused with that is what created Wales. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my seven now Patreons for supporting me. Thank you very much, Diochenbauer. And for any of you simply wanting to watch these videos, my heart goes out to you. You are helping this go on. And we'll see you in the next episode.